Thank you, Toastmasters, Toastmasters, and honored guests. Organ music rises in a familiar old tune as a man steps out of a medical building. His footsteps are heard along the sidewalk towards the bus stop where a woman and a young child are seated. The child is very energetic and talking nonstop about many things, family issues, a brother taking care of a sister, a thief, violence, strange visitors, adultery, friends becoming enemies, and secrets. The man is intrigued and asks the woman, Is your child seeing a family counselor? The woman looks at him with a confused expression. A second later, she laughs, realizing what he meant. Oh no, he's just talking about the soap opera we watch. Embarrassed, the man steps back from the bus stop. The organ music rises once more and then fades out. This all happened many years ago, and I was that little child. When I was young, my mother and I would regularly watch soap operas. It was soap operas where I first began to understand story and character development. I quickly learned the tropes of the soaps, such as when a character gives a slight cough <coughs> in the middle of a conversation, you know they'll be in a hospital by the month's end. Here was laid the first foundation of me becoming a writer. Perhaps not the best foundation. It was better than the repetitive cliches of sitcoms like Three's Company, which seemed to only have one plot, being misunderstood. What I didn't realize was how it was all connected to my love of old-time radio. Romance stories were part of pulp magazines alongside mystery, adventures, and westerns, but it would be in radio that it first became the pop culture phenomenon called soap operas. It all began in 1930 with Painted Dreams, a radio serial created by Irma Phillips, who would go on to create today's children, Road to Life, Women in White, and most successfully, Guiding Light. Guiding Light led the way into television, where Miss Phillips became known as Queen of the Soaps, and go on to create shows like As the World Turns, Another World, and co-create the series my mother and I were so dedicated to, Days of Our Lives. During their radio years, Procter & Gamble became the sponsor of many of these serials, and so the soap was added to the opera. Housewives weren't the only audience for these shows. As the years progressed and televisions were installed on college campuses, students would spend a great amount of their time watching soaps. The soaps were the queen of daytime television for many decades, but historical events would interrupt their reign. In 1987, the Iran-Contra hearings, followed by the Oliver North trial in 1989, would interfere with daytime television programming for many months, and the soap operas suffered as people never knew when the next episode would air. Then in 1995 came the trial of the century, lasting from January 24th to October 3rd, the murder trial of O.J. Simpson. For eight months, the networks televised the trial instead of soaps and daytime programming. Many shows never recovered, while others limped along. The events of 9-11 would change everything as everyone watched only the news. The first Gulf War had its impact but nothing like what happened in 2001. Television producers wondered if serials and comedies were something they should be producing after such tragic events. Eventually, the networks got back on their feet, but the wounds were great and many soap operas would not survive. Currently, there are only four soap operas. CBS has Young and the Restless and Bold and the Beautiful. ABC only has General Hospital. As for Days of Our Lives, 
that my mother and I watched without fail, NBC has shoved it over to the streaming platform Peacock, where you have to subscribe to watch. So I pay tribute to the longest existing genre of television and radio, well remembered from my childhood. As the woman and her child climbed aboard the bus, the organ music fades into the background. Whatever happened to that bewildered man left on the side of the street, we will never know. Thank you.